All right, well, we'll bring Tim up on stage, and then uh, he can introduce the panel for you. Tim Plakovich, everybody. Pleasure. Folks, thank you so much. I think you're really, really going to enjoy the program today. This is my fourth Cherry Blossom Festival. Had the opportunity to come over and speak uh, four years ago um, about a, a, a Civil War book that I had written. So this is my first opportunity to do something outside of that genre. And so having the opportunity to be able to interview Bill Verdon and to be able to have uh, come to visit the last several days with his lovely wife, Shirley, whom we would not be able to do this with, with, without Shirley. She, you, will, you will love some of her anecdotal stories as well. We're also very, very lucky to have with us David Jerome. David Jerome is a longtime friend of the Verdons. Uh, he was their minister for several years. He's taught at the collegiate level, is an historical author, and also has embarked on a new project. He's currently interviewing Bill to get to pen Bill's memoirs. And so I thought after meeting David yesterday um, at the Blackberry Bed and Breakfast, and, and thank you so much again, Dave. What a wonderful place to stay. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the Blackberry Retreat Bed and Breakfast, just, just a dynamic place, and you're so lucky to have it so close by. So even if you live in Marshfield, and, and you're only just a few miles away, just go out there some night. <laughs> but anyway, had a wonderful opportunity to speak with Dave. He's a bastion of historical and baseball knowledge, and, and baseball is history. Baseball has been such an important and integral part of the American experience for so long. Such an important a fabric in, in, in the lives of, of, of so many Americans. Baseball is America. And so we're so lucky to have Bill to interview him for the next hour. I think you'll enjoy this very much. Thank you for coming out on such an, uh, for such an early event at 9 o'clock to kick off the festival. I also want to thank Rob and Sally Rains for coming from St. Louis. Rob, if you have, if you have had a chance, some of you have probably seen it, um, the wonderful piece that Rob did on Bill in the Missouri Cherry Blossom Festival magazine, Our America, in this past winter's issue. If you didn't have a chance to read it, please purchase a copy. I imagine that probably copies Rob would be, on, uh, would be available to purchase here at the festival. So please do. It's a wonderful piece on Bill. It captures the essence of, of this extraordinary baseball icon. Bill, I have to tell you, I don't know if you realize this, but... I actually hadn't planned on coming to the festival this year. And um, uh, I was just you know, going to wait until maybe next year and uh, had a call from Nicholas Inman, the director, a couple weeks ago. And he said, Tim, how would you like to interview Bill Verdon at 9 o'clock on Thursday? I said, like? I said, I'm going to come now for sure. <laughs> and, and I said, that is definitely worth the 650-mile round trip. My gosh. Hi, Jack. And, and why wouldn't I come? I mean, to be able to interview Bill, and, and now what a special treat it is to have joining us as well, his wife Shirley and David Jerome. So, so let's go ahead. <laughs> Bill, let's kind of start back uh, toward the beginning, if we could, a little bit. Um, I thought it was so interesting because I didn't realize this until talking to Shirley, and then you elaborated on it. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago, the fact that you played very, very little high school baseball. And, and here he was. He was signed by the Pirates out of high school, although he had not, sign, uh, had not played yeah. much high school baseball. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or, or, I'm sorry, with the Yankees. Bill was originally signed by the Yankees by the same gentleman who signed um, uh, Mickey Mantle, uh, Tom Greenway, as well as a plethora of other players in the Springfield area. But, so Bill, if you could tell us the circumstances surrounding that, how it was that, um, that you were able to sign with the Yankees not having played much high school mm -hmm. baseball. I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was lucky. I enjoyed baseball and I always liked to play it, but I went out and played amateur ball in Kansas. Okay, okay. And that's where he had scouted me. Okay. okay. So I'll give him credit. He went. He made a choice. Yes. He took his time and went out there and saw me. And I guess he 
decided he liked me. Bill, how did he, how did he hear about you? Was, was that team on which you were playing, did it have some other notable players at the time? Or? Well, I think it was noted for its amateur okay. play in the summertime. Okay. And so they always went out there and scouted them. Okay. okay. I just happened to be there. Isn't that interesting? You know, I said to Bill yesterday, I said, so w what's the deal, you know, with Tom Greenway and the Yankees? You know, he signed Mickey Mantle and, and, and he signed Bill as well as we say, you know, a cornucopia of other players for the Yankee organization from, from this part of Missouri and, and, and from uh, part of Oklahoma. And, and uh, so I, I was surprised when Bill said to me, when I said, well, who else scouted you? You know, what other teams offered you contracts? Because, of course, at this time, folks, you know, we're talking about 1949, uh, you know, late 40s, early 50s. We didn't have the player draft, the major league player draft, amateur draft, until 1965. So, <laughs> so the six, there could have been possibly 16 teams who could have been, you know, vying for, for Bill's services. So, Bill, were there any other teams at all? Who, who were interested in pursuing you at that time? Not that I know of. That's interesting. <laughs> it, the Yankees got a pretty good deal. Okay. Now, now Shirley, Bill was still in the Yankee organization when, when you two met and then married, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I loved that story. If you could relate to everyone for us how that union came about. <laughs> well, some of them have probably are aware of it because everyone wants to hear that story. Um, I was fresh out of college and Bill lived in West Plains and he, I was lucky enough to obtain a job teaching in the high school in West Plains. And so that fall I was there and some of my students said, we have somebody that you should meet. <laughs> and uh, they happened, they had pestered me about going to their little teen place where they had a jukebox and you could eat and stuff. And I thought that it was not proper for the teacher to associate. And you weren't too much older than they. No, I just turned 21. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> my first job, obviously. And so anyway, they kept on from the day school started for when I first met them. For, and I finally said, okay, I'll go, but just for about 30 minutes. <laughs> so, and I didn't have a car or anything, you know, and I had a roommate who was, uh, the PE teacher, uh, she'd come from, we were grads of Southeast Missouri State now, over in Cape Girardeau. And so we'd come over there together to West Plains to teach. Yes. And um, anyway, I was, I finally went with those kids and they took me down there because I didn't have a car and uh, to the little, place, teen place, and so when my 30 minutes was up, why, <laughs> I said, okay, time for me to leave. And so they said, oh, we'll take you, we'll take you. And so uh, we got in the car and there were four of them and three of them, I guess, in there with me. Yes. And uh, as we went through the square and on the corner drugstore uh, against the light pole was Bill standing and he had been a good athlete in high school, so they all knew him. Of course, he was just like two years out of high school. Yes. And so anyway, they said, there's somebody you need to meet. And on the way back to where I was staying, I had a room in a private home. And so they told me all about him, about him, playing baseball and he was playing professional baseball and all of this and he had just completed his second year of, com of, of baseball and, and so uh, then 
when I got back to my room and I, they left, and um, I had the phone ring, and so it was my roommate, and she said, will you come over here? There's an extra guy at this, she was on a blind date. <laughs> And I said, no, I just got home. Well, there's an extra person over here, and I'm <laughs> by myself, and I'm so bored. And <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, but I'm not staying long. <laughs> and so anyway, in about mm, 10 minutes, you know, in West Plains, you could get almost all over town in 10 minutes. And uh, so the doorbell rang mm -hmm. and I went down and answered it thinking it was my roommate coming to pick me up no it was my students who came and they said we've got somebody out here in the car we want you to meet well guess who it was they had gone <laughs> straight back down there downtown picked him up and brought him out there to meet me at this house where I was staying. And um, so about the same time, my roommate came with the extra guy to pick me up. And it so happened that the extra guy knew him and he found out he was in the car. So he went over and he started talking to him. He was the son of the former principal at West Plains. Okay. So I just finally said, hello, we've exchanged names, and he asked me if I'd like to go get a Coke sometime, and I said, yeah, I probably could. <laughs> and that was our first meeting. And so then, um, I don't know if it was the next day or the next day. I think it was the next morning. That's uh, what. <laughs> I received a call to see if I'd like to go have some coffee or a Coke in the evening after school or at that night. And so I said yes. And then we saw each other quite a bit and he went to Kansas City to get a job because he you know, needed to work in the winter because minor league baseball players don't make much money. And so um, that's what he did. And so he was gone for two weeks, and then he came back. He didn't get a job, evidently. And, yes. And so <laughs> he was we thinking saw each about other, other things. Yeah. And <laughs> well, I had two letters from him while he's gone. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, five or six weeks, and I don't remember for sure. After we met, we eloped in Salem, Arkansas. And um, went down, and went to the clerk's office, and got our license. And I asked if they could show me where the Methodist church was. And so I went over to the church, and the minister arranged for us to come back that evening. And, and we were married, and so, or we were having the ceremony, and the minister's wife was our other witness. Uh -huh. And the choir was practicing for Christmas. It was in November the 17th, and they were doing their Christmas practicing. So we had Christmas carols for music. And, <laughs> and then I had to tell my mother and dad because I dreaded doing that because I knew they weren't going to like it. And, <laughs> My dad, I don't think, ever liked anybody I dated. And so anyway, it was two weeks. Uh, we went over one week to tell them, and I lost my nerve and couldn't tell them. <laughs> and so then we went back the second week, and I told them, and my dad said, I'm going to see the license. <laughs> but. He was easy because he was such a baseball person. Yes. My dad had played a little town ball when he was when I was a baby, and mother took me to all those games. It was a like a 
Sunday afternoon game that they had in town. And so he, and then growing up, we went to St. Louis to see the St. Louis Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals all the time. And some of you don't even remember the St. Louis Browns probably, but <laughs> I got to see them a lot. And, you uh, were a huge brownie, or your brother, my Ronnie, brother was, was a huge a brownie, brownie fan, fan. Yeah. yes. And you, you know, see, the thing, the thing is about all of this, folks, Bill may only have been sought after by the Yankees. Shirley was being sought after by just about everyone. I have to tell you, I, I, I had to go to the bathroom before we started, and I went over to the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival teacher's breakfast that they're having. And I met a gentleman who was about three or four years younger than Shirley, who came up to me and said, why are you here? And I said, well, I'm going to be interviewing Bill Verdon this morning. And he said, oh, let me tell you. He said, I had Shirley for an English teacher. <laughs> and she said, every junior and senior in that high school wanted to take her out. <laughs> so, Bill, you may only have had the Yankees looking after you. Everybody was hot for Shirley. <laughs> so, well, uh, Bill, I wanted, I wanted to ask. <laughs> Bill, I wanted to ask you. So, so you came up, you spent a couple of years in the Yankee system, and, and for, whom, for whom were you traded over to the Pirates? Who was I what? Who were you traded for? To the, to the Cardinals. I'm sorry, to the Cardinals, rather. Yeah. Who was involved in that deal, do you remember? Bobby Del Greco. Bobby Del Greco. Oh, sure. Dick Littlefield. Okay. Dick Littlefield. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Del Greco, was, was he a middle infielder? No, he was an outfielder. He was an outfielder. Okay. Okay, so, so then you spent, had a stellar season in 1954 with the Cardinals, his first year. He was National League Rookie of the Year, and... 55. Yeah. He, he had a stellar year with the Rochester. Uh, oh, in 54, in the International League, yes. He had a yes. stellar year there, but he was Rookie of the Year for the Cardinals in St. Louis in 55. In 55, okay. So then we start the 1956 season, folks, and after having had this tremendous season, becoming the darling of St. Louis... Only one team in St. Louis by then now. The Brownies have moved to Baltimore and uh, become the Orioles. And so here, Bill, he's had this terrific rookie year. And Shirley was telling me, you know, well, yeah, they were going to make St. Louis their home. They were planning on buying a, buying a house. And so what happened then, Bill? I got traded. He got <laughs> traded. As a baseball life goes, so on he goes to Pittsburgh. And, and, and who were you traded for at that time, Bill? Bobby Del Greco. Oh, that was Del yeah. Greco. Okay. In okay. Littlefield. Okay. Uh, Trader Lane is oh, the one that did my. that, and that was the worst decision he had ever made. He would admit later. This this guy to, to whom Dave is referencing, this Frank Lane. They called his nickname was Trader Frank Lane. Frank was a, a baseball lifer. Uh, he'd been general manager for for Cincinnati. He came to the Cardinals. After the Cardinals, he went on and was uh, uh, general manager for the Indians and made a trade there that almost cost him his life. Some of you might remember uh, Rocky Colavito, the home run hitter for, for Cleveland. Well, he traded him to, to Detroit one year straight up for Harvey Keene. My gosh, every, every teenage girl in Cleveland was ready to kill this <laughs> Frank Trader Lane. Well, I said, so I said to uh, Shirley, you know, I said, so was Frank Lane the general manager of the Cardinals at that time when, when Bill was traded? Her response was, Oh, yes. <laughs> and Shirley, if you could just relate that story quickly about how you found out okay. about Bill's trade over to Pittsburgh. Well, we had a daughter, and she was constantly having sore throats. She was three, four years old. I don't remember if she was... I could add it up, but I didn't. And uh, she was just having them. And so th at that time, they removed your tonsils readily. And because growing up, I had a sore throat all the time too, but they didn't want to remove my tonsils then. So, but they did with her and she was, so I was at the hospital in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and um, with 
my daughter, and I was trying to keep her entertained until they came to get her to remove the tonsils. And so at that, in those years, many of the beds had these little machines that were a radio that you put a dime in and it would play 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Well, that's what I did to entertain Debbie because she was up and trying to climb out of the bed and all kinds of things. And, and uh, so <laughs> I put that dime in and that radio came on and the first thing I heard <laughs> was the National League Rookie of the Year of 1955 has and said his name, has been traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates for Bobby Del Greco. And I thought, I can't believe this, because I'd not heard anything about it. We didn't have any idea he was going to be traded. And so, anyway, my mother was visiting to, with a former player who was working. He was just retired and working there. Yeah. And I ran out, they were in the hallway talking. Yes. I ran out there and I said, did you hear what they said on that radio? They said <laughs> Bill had been traded. And, and they looked and, and smiled. Well, Harry Kimberlin, who was a pitcher, and he pitched for the Browns at one time, uh, had heard it before, and he came and told my mother, but they didn't want to tell me because they didn't want to get me upset with Debbie having her tonsils out. <laughs> so that's how I found out that he had been traded, and it was, I don't think it was late at night when they told him yes. even. And um, anyway, it was a big surprise for us. <laughs> Well, one thing, Bill, it certainly worked out well because you had a tremendous career in Pittsburgh, and and uh, just think about that. It, ten, t about ten great years, wasn't it? Wasn't sixty-five probably your last season? Yeah. Um, you know, you think about some of the people that Bill had the opportunity to play alongside of, and if you, if you ever wonder what kind of a center fielder Bill Verdon was, just think about this, folks. Roberto Clemente played right and Bill Verdon played center. I think that says volumes right there. Bill, let's talk about some of those years because when, when you joined the Pirates, uh, Clemente had just joined the Pirates recently. You, you two came to <coughs> Pittsburgh right at about that same, at about that same period. Um, what, what kind of a ball club did the Pirates have when you got there? We were very mediocre. Okay. But it didn't take too many years before that mediocrity uh, turned to a first division team, didn't it? Well, Murtaugh in 58 helped out a lot. Yes. Murtaugh joined the team in 58 as manager, and I think that helped a lot. Yes. Because if you remember, folks, by 19, late 50s and then by 1960, here Bill is patrolling center field at cavernous Forbes Field. It was huge. You see, you think about what kind of wheels Bill must have had to be able to uh, play well in, in that outfield. and what, what a terrific center fielder he was. That was a great ball club, Bill. That 1960 team won the National League pennant. Pittsburgh hadn't won a pennant in 33 years, I think. So, can, so, I, make, yeah. can I make two Dave. quick points on his speed? Sure. Uh, the first one was in the spring of 48 when Bill was a junior. And he was playing in a fundraising event, baseball fundraiser, yes. uh, down in Salem, Arkansas. Uh -huh. And they were raising money for lights on, for the field. And uh -huh. Preacher Rowe, who was a well-known mm. pitcher in, for Brooklyn at that time, mm -hmm. the Dodgers, uh, came in to kind of showcase the whole fundraising. Well, Bill was playing yes. center field. And when, pre and when the game was over, Preacher said, boy, that center fielder is something else and something to that effect. Yeah. But also in the spring of 49, his senior year, um, West Plains had a track meet in, against Houston, Kabul, other teams in the area. Yes. And they had t 93 total points as a team. Bill accounted for over 30 of those points personally. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, in the relays that he ran, the dashes that he ran, all those types of things. So yes. that kind of goes to the, his speed. Bill, you, <laughs> you, you had to, oh my gosh, just thinking about that, that ballpark in Pittsburgh, Forbes Field. Bill, how deep was it in, in left center and in center field? Do you remember the dimensions? Well, it was 460. Oh my gosh, think about that. 460 to left center. To left center. Yeah. That made you... Over 500 deep center. Just think about that. Didn't they have the batting cage that was that was out in center field? Because Ooh, left no center. One... Yeah, yeah. And, and it, they had a tarp around it and it never came into play. Isn't that so? And you, know, and you think about some of these other ballparks too. Uh, you know, the polo grounds would have been kind of like mm -hmm. that, that too, Bill. You know, it, it, and you know, for instance, like at the polo grounds would have been really short down the left field line and down the right field line, and well under 300 feet. You know, at, at, down the lines. But polo grounds went like this. Yeah, it was like there a was horseshoe, no, wasn't it? No though? left and right center. Yeah, yeah. What was it like? 487 in center field at the polo grounds. So in center field? Yeah. No, 580. Okay. Oh my gosh. So just that you need a cannon to hit it out of the, some of these old ballparks. So anyway, so Bill had all this ground to patrol and in, in center for the Pirates during those years. Bill, let's talk a little bit about that 1960 ball club because uh, of course Clemente has come into his own by then. You're at the at the top of the list among uh, National League players and Bill Mazeroski is playing second. You win your first pennant in 33 years and then upset the Yankees in the World Series. Tell us a little bit about, about that ball club. Well, it was a good club. We never gave up. It seemed like all year, every time we needed something, we got it. Bill, who were the writers favoring that season? Were they, were they favoring the Braves or the Dodgers more that year? or or? Were you guys considered to be contenders? I don't think so. Okay. So kind of a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. We did it. <laughs> and uh, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, weren't a lot of those games in that series really lopsided, the score? Yes, they were. The Yankees outscored them significantly. Uh, yes. They should have, statistically, the Yankees should have won that series. Yes. But no. it, it came it came down to Bill's I don't want to hear that. De <laughs> defense really did make a lot of the difference. In fact, yes. uh, it, some of you may go by the Missouri State Hall of, uh, Sports Hall of Fame. You'll see a guy out there reaching for a ball. It's a full blown statue of this gentleman here, and that's basically represents the catch that he made in the first game against Yogi Berra. Uh, had Bill not have caught that ball, uh, the Yankees, I think, could have scored about two runs, and that could have made the difference in that first game. <laughs> but Bill, in the fourth game, was the deciding factor on both sides of the ball, you know, both defense and offense. Uh, a key clutch a hit against, he caught, he caught a uh, ball against serve, and he also made a clutch hit that made the difference in the game. So um, I hope I answered your question. Yes, very yeah. much. Um, but I want to say that Casey Stingle, when that series was over, uh, Casey Stingle uh, basically made the comment that uh, that center fielder has given us trouble all year. Well, they didn't play him all year. They just played him during the series. Right, right. But Casey Stingle basically said that center fielder gave us trouble all year. Right. And Danny Murtaugh, right. before the series started, said, you're going to see a center fielder that you're not going to believe, and I'm not talking about Mickey Mantle. That, that so, said volumes, yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. They'll bring anything up. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, let's talk. I want to talk about Danny Murtaugh, your, your manager. And, um, you know, uh, but I want to get back and talk to you just a little bit about Roberto Clemente. And tell us a little bit about what it was like playing alongside Clemente all those years. Well, he was a good player. There's no question about that. He was very immature when he came up. Okay. And we weren't happy with him when he first came up. Okay. But he matured. The time he finished, he was one of the best. Okay. 
Do you think that that may have been particularly hard for him coming from Puerto Rico at that time? Yeah, he, did. That? he hadn't been taught the right way. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Could he, could he speak the language well, Bill? Surely Pretty shaking her head, no. <laughs> Pretty good. Language was his big problem. He, uh -huh. he could speak, but he was, spoke with an accent, and I think he just was so unsure, and here he was in a country, I don't know that he had ever really been out very much and, and exposed to what you're facing when you come into another country and start playing, yes. even though he had been <laughs> playing in Puerto Rico. Yes. But it was different coming, and, and he had learned English but he still, it was, it was like me and my Spanish, probably. I, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you don't use it all the time, then you lose some of it. Right, so. right. You know, Dave, I've always wondered about uh, about Clemente in uh, in uh, Pittsburgh and Hank Aaron in Milwaukee, and thinking about Frank Robinson in Cincinnati. If they had played in bigger markets, you know, Clemente, for instance. Right. Imagine the publicity Clemente would have drawn with all of that talent. Well, same thing with a center fielder named Bill Verdon. But in the same way with a center fielder right. named Bill Verdon, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Clemente had other obstacles too. You know, he was a person of color. He had to, mm -hmm. they had to deal with that. In spring training, the, the Pirates were at Fort Myers down at, at that time. And, yes. And yeah. when they did uh, away games during the preseason, mm -hmm. uh, they weren't allowed to stay in motels. They had to go play the game and then drive clear back to Fort Myers. And a lot of had to do with the fact that Clemente was on the bus. Yes. And so they had that to overcome too. And, and you can only understand the time that we're talking about, the 50s. I mean, it was, that factored in, I think, to him being um, a little shy and nervous. And, and uh, Bill, Bill had an incredible range factor as a center fielder, and he had a mm -hmm. lot of assist in both left field and right field. Yes. And I, Bill would never admit this, but I, I believe Bill was very good for Roberto's development in the outfield. Interesting then, because, <laughs> because when Bill takes his first managerial job, which is with Pittsburgh, he has Clemente at the end of, his, at the end of Clemente's career. And so he had a chance not only to play with him, but to manage him as well. And uh, Bill, I wanted to, we'll talk about that, but I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about Danny Murtaugh, you know, for whom you played all of those years. And Danny Murtaugh managed Pittsburgh, what was it, maybe four different times? Three different times three. at least, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so Bill had the opportunity, uh, he, retired fairly early as a player because Bill, you only would have been about 34 when, when you took a managerial job in the Pirate minor league system, came up, becomes one of Danny Murtaugh's coaches. Uh, that was in the Mets minor league system. Oh, in the Mets yeah. system, okay. He went to the Mets for two years in 66 and 67. Okay, okay. And then Bill ends up uh, as a coach for Danny Murtaugh in Pittsburgh. And then when Danny retires, after the Pirates won the World Series in 71, Bill becomes manager. Bill, how did that feel? All those years playing for Danny Murtaugh, and then you have the opportunity to take the reins from him. Well, he was the best I ever played for. Uh huh. He always, he never made a mistake. What was it about, so it was his strategy that strategically? He, knew every, he just knew it all. Uh huh. He did the right things. And he didn't have all those saber metrics that they have today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't that so? Um, any stories about Danny in particular? Uh, the, the, or, or just overall? Just, you know, just the kind of person that he was? I don't know any special story because he never looked for any attention. Mm -hmm. He just yeah. did it and accepted it and went on. Yeah, I remember that about him, a very low-key, very low-key guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did that feel then when he retired and, and Mr. Brown offered you the job with the Pirates then uh, to, to follow in Danny's footsteps? Well, I, I wanted to stay in the games. Yes. And so managing was about the only way to do it. Yes. 
So I was happy to be able to do it. Yes. Okay. I accepted it and went on from there. Yes. So Bill managed, uh, Dave, what was it a season and a half with, with the Pirates? And, and, then, and then the Pirates. 72 and, and, and most of 73, yes. Yeah, yeah. Remember that, remember that season in 73? Rob, you'll remember this. Remember, no one could win in the National League East that year. I think the Mets were in last place in late August, and they ended up winning the pennant. They, they finally put together a few wins at the end of the season. But, yeah, so, Bill, uh, Mr. Brown let you go in, in 73. And then, ironically, he brings Danny back, doesn't he? Joel yeah. Brown would also admit later that it was a mistake to fire Bill. Yes. To have fired him. Yes. Yeah. Which there was is really it? no reason to fire him. There wasn't. Yes, yeah. right. He come back and he apologized to me. He said, I, I didn't have anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. I said, I know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Danny. Yeah, Danny Murray. Yeah, Danny. Right, right. Danny, I, we, we were in Cincinnati, and, and I don't recall exactly why we were in Cincinnati at the time, but the club was there, and the Pirates, it was after Bill was fired. Yes. And... We were in the dining room, and Danny was there eating breakfast, and, and we had just eaten, I guess, and we went by the table to say hello to him and, and, and talk to him for a few minutes. Yes. And he looked up at me, and he said, you know, I didn't want to be here. Yes. And I said, yeah, I know that. He was in shock that uh, that they were going to fire him, yeah. uh, Bill, and yes. then hire him because Bill yes. made two visits to Joe L. Brown's office the day he was fired. Yes, and Bill was on the way to a, a handball uh, game, mm -hmm. uh, and so his first visit was short. And then, uh, and I guess at that time uh, there was a call out to Danny, uh, but when Bill came back the second time. Yes. Uh, Danny was already in shock that he was that Brown was firing Bill and offering him the job again. Bill didn't have the opportunity to say goodbye to his team that day. All the stuff was loaded on the two on the buses because they were going to go to Philadelphia to play, yes. and they had to take all of Bill's stuff off the bus, uh, unload it, and Bill didn't get the opportunity to say goodbye to his team. Oh. Oh. Now this all this That's all works why out. We were there in Cincinnati, but I don't remember what. Now this all works out so interestingly, though, Shirley, because at the same time, Ralph Hawk, who was managing the Yankees, is ready to step down, so he retires. He resigns after the 1973 <laughs> season. He was mad. He didn't want to work for George Steinbrenner. Right, right. George <laughs> George Steinbrenner had just bought the Yankees, so Bill becomes George Steinbrenner's actual first hire as manager. Bill, tell us about that, that short tenure. Everybody had a short tenure under Steinbrenner. <laughs> tell, tell us about that tenure under Steinbrenner. There was none. <laughs> <laughs> what did... I never had to deal with him. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Okay. He never called on me. Okay. And I never went to him. Okay. So was Gabe Paul the general manager of the Yankees at that time? Yes. Okay. But what happened was Steinbrenner had gotten into some kind of a political thing and he was suspended by baseball yes. Yes. from any contact. Yes. So I didn't have to deal with him. And, but I did. You did? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about, us about that contact. Well, he was very nice to me uh, <coughs> in his own way. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> He invited me up in the suite every game. Okay. His suite. And so I went up there and, but he never really quizzed me about anything very much. He did not. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that would have been the end of my going up in the suite, and I didn't really like being in the suite. I always liked to sit and stand. Keeping sure. in mind that George couldn't really officially, he could not interact with Bill no. because of the suspension. He yes. could, so he went through Shirley to, to try to... Trying to yeah. get information, yeah. But we, yeah. Didn't, 
do too many discussions on Bill or messages to Bill. There were I didn't pay any attention to her. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, as, as Bill said, it was a short tenure with, with the Yankees. Um, the next season in, in 75, uh, I believe it was in the middle of the year, Steinbrenner decides that he's going to make the first of a million managerial changes. And, he and that's after Bill became the manager of the year for the American League right. in 74. Right, he was manager of the year in 74, and Steinbrenner wasn't, you know, I, I don't know. So anyway, so he fires Bill, brings in Billy Martin for yeah. Billy's first managerial run with the Yankees. But, but just like in all of these other cases, every time something unfortunate happened to Bill, something better came along. Absolutely. And so, so Bill, it was just a few weeks after that that you took over the reins of Houston, and, and Bill had his longest managerial run in Houston. Had terrific years with the Astro. That was, we were talking about that yesterday at lunch. What a fun ball club that was. <laughs> Folks, the Astrodome, which wasn't as, Bill, the, the gaps weren't as big in the Astrodome as they were in Pittsburgh, but nevertheless, it was big, my gosh. Dave, wasn't it like 390 in, in left and right center? Yeah, it wasn't Houston? a hitter's park. It was a pitcher's park. No, but, uh, and, and, and Bill worked so closely with the general manager, Tal Smith. If you could tell us about that, Bill, because they, they developed they, a team with such great gap hitters. Well, yeah. coincidentally, you know, strangely enough, when Tal was there in the mid-60s, and he was yes. actually the program manager in charge of building the Astrodome. Oh, okay. Back in the 60s. Okay. Yeah. So he had a lot to do with the architecture he did. He did. of the... In fact, out in center field, they had a little slant out there, and they called it Tal's Hill Yeah. in center field. It's, Folks, no, longer there, it's there, no longer there. Know. It was no longer there. There are guys in the big leagues, uh, teams in the big leagues today, one player who hit more home runs, I think, than, than Houston did one year as a team when Bill was there. But they had such great ball clubs. Bill, tell us about those years in Houston and that speed that you had, that great pitching with... Uh, you know, with James Rodney Richard and, and uh, later Necro. with Nolan Ryan and Joe Necro. Right. If you could tell us about those Houston years. Well, I had good club. And the pitching was pretty... But you had a lot to do with developing that team, didn't well, you? Well, you'll say anything. <laughs> <laughs> when Bill took over that, when Bill and Tal took over that team, Tal left New York on August 7th. Bill yeah. was fired on August 1st, but and so they had about a you know week together. They were neighbors on Long Island, uh, the Verdens and the Smiths were. Okay. And Tal knew he was going to Houston. Well, he gets down to Houston and realizes that he needed to make a managerial change. You know, Preston Gomez was the manager. Yes. And he let Preston uh, manage for another couple of weeks, and then he had to go, and then... He yes. knew Bill was available, so he calls Bill and says, how would you like a, a job? And so Bill goes down there, and the, and the Astros are 43 and a half games out of first place. The only other team in Major League Baseball that had a worse record was were the Detroit Tigers in the American League. How would you like to inherit a team, folks, 43 and a half games out in August? And so, and that was the landscape in which Bill started with that team, and they went nothing, uh, they went straight, they went up. And yes. So by 1979, they had a tremendous team. Yes. That's the way to take over, because you know you can get better. Yeah. The, only, the only way to go is up, yeah. Oh, and just thinking about the, the teams that they had back in 79, 80, because you won the division then, Bill, in 80, yeah. What a terrific series. Uh, National League Championship Series that was oh, against geez. Philadelphia. Oh my God, uh, 41 years ago, and I think it's still etched in people's minds. Five, five game, full five game series, and four of those games went into extra yes. innings. Yes. Yeah. Bill, they so were six, six game. They were six outs away from going to the World Series against the Royals in 1980. Yes. So, so Bill, you know, having managed in in, in Pittsburgh and New York and Houston and later in Montreal. Which managerial tenure did you enjoy the most? Which, which, which years? Which, which clubs did you enjoy managing the most? Which team? Well, winning teams. Yeah. <laughs> more fun. But, but did, you have, did you have more uh, 
would you say more continuity with Tal Smith as general manager, maybe than with the other general managers yeah. you worked with? Okay. Yeah. yeah. We Shirley, were closer than the rest of them. Okay. So Shirley, what, what about you? During Bill's managerial years, which teams did you enjoy the most? Because he probably came home and talked, did he talk about it a little bit when he would come home? Not really. Okay. <laughs> um, but the thing was the relationship, I think, between Bill and the general manager. Yes. And it so happened that I met Johnny Smith, Tal's wife, December 73. Uh, about uh, before we went to the Yankees, mm -hmm. uh, right before, we had the winter meetings in Houston, and so <laughs> they always have a wives, they try to entertain the wives when you go to a winter meeting. So we had a wives luncheon, and I just happened to be seated across from Johnny Smith and we got acquainted and we discussed the fact that they were going to to New York shortly because Tal was going to work for the Yankees and yes and that we Bill in the meantime had after he had been fired he accepted a triple A job in Denver at that time who was the AAA club for the Astros. So Bill was going to come, go there. Yes. And so then this job became available for the Yankees. And so Johnny and I, up on our first meeting, were saying, gee, we just kind of hit it off. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she said, it's too bad. We're going up there and you're and you're leaving, and you're gone. You won't be there, and we could have had a good time, and I, and I agreed, and then here we were. We ended up with them, and we lived just through the woods from each other out on Long Island, and, and we still have a very good friendship with them, and yes. they've been up here. They've been to Springfield, and, and of course, we haven't seen each other in a little while, but we still stay in contact. Yes. Um, I wanted to, and Shirley, you'll remember this. I know this will be etched in your memory because Bill was managing Houston at that time. Bill, I wanted to ask you about during that 1980 season, Houston having such a great one run, they end up winning the National League West, that terrific series that Dave was talking about, the National League Championship Series against Philadelphia. James Rodney Richard, you remember the terrific right-handed pitcher, flamethrower. Oh my gosh, he could throw a raspberry through a brick wall, I think. And uh, Bob Prince used to use that expression, Bill. <laughs> He's a raspberry through a brick wall. But, uh, James Rodney Richard, you remember, folks, suffered that stroke in the middle of the season. I think it was probably about, about the end of July. Bill, I wanted to ask you, did you have indication at that time that Richard may have been having some problems prior to the stroke? Mm -mm. Yeah. None. Yeah. Isn't that so? T tell us a little bit about that day when he, di di didn't he collapse uh, during a workout? I don't recall. I think something like that, yes. It was very obvious to the athlete, to the trainer, that he was struggling and they, I think they assisted him off the field, in fact. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I, I can remember some sports writers prior to that, it seemed like they were kind of saying some nasty things, you know, just wondering why he wasn't finishing as many games as, as he had been earlier. Some sports writers do that. So. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Most of them didn't play. That's right, exactly. Now, Rob doesn't fall into that category. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so from Houston then, Bill has one more managerial tenure, and he inherits a ball club in Montreal in 1983 that's a pretty good, pretty darn good ball club. Uh, Gary Carter on that team, Andre Dawson playing center, Steve Rogers, and Dee, you were telling me that Steve grew up in this area. Uh, Bill Gullickson, you had some pretty good pitching on that team, Bill. 
pretty good, pretty good ball club. Tell us a little bit about what it was like those those two years in Montreal. Well, I enjoyed the city. Uh huh. It was one of the cleanest towns I've ever been in. Okay. Okay. C kind of neat taking over a, a team that was laden with a lot of talent too. Yeah. Yeah. We had a chance to win. You know, we were we were talking yesterday, Dave and, and, and Bill. I was. Dave and I were talking about this that I remember hearing Al Oliver interviewed uh, who was playing for Montreal at that time and Bill of course had had Al, Al Oliver uh, with the Pirates you know years earlier and Al was by then playing in Montreal and he was so excited when he heard that the Expos had hired Bill to manage in Montreal, Dave, wasn't it? Yeah, he, uh, Al, I had the opportunity to visit with Al uh, about two and a half weeks ago, and it was a wonderful interview, and we talked about the Pittsburgh days. Um, but Al would be the first to admit that Bill insisted on three things as a manager, and that was defense, speed, and pitching. Uh, and he believed in very much the fundamentals of baseball. If you could get the fundamentals down, if you can do the basics of your position and get that down, then you'll be ready for the spectacular, you know, the, yes. the, 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 the anomalies of somebody doing something really weird or, yes. or strange. And so he was big in that, and Al echoed that very much. And, and he was big, you know, Bill had this thing called the fungo bat. And he absolutely worked the... We don't use these words sometimes, but we work, he worked the tails off of the outfield and with that fungo bat. And he, he was an expert with that fungo bat, and he could put that ball exactly where he wanted it every time. And Al said that he would put it, that ball just at the point where he knew that the, the player could reach the ball, but he really had to work hard to get to the ball. And that really improved his speed as an outfielder and made a lot of difference in his game. Yes. Well, that's almost true. <laughs> <laughs> well, something else about Al Oliver, Bill. My gosh, that guy was a hitting machine. What a oh. terrific hitter he Over was. Over 303 career batting average. Yes. Yeah. What about him? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was just a great hitter. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was fun having him. Well, so Bill, Bill manages the Expos for a couple of years. And then in later in, in the, I suppose it was the early 90s, is that, would that be right, Dave? Probably in the early 90s, Bill, when you came back to Pittsburgh as a coach? 86. 86. Under Jim Leland. Uh, under Jim Leland, okay. Chuck Tanner had been fired as the pirate manager, and he had had that job for a long time. Pirates had pretty rough season in 85, and Jim Leland comes in. And Jim Leland and the Pirates bring back Bill. Bill, you served then as a coach for the Pirates for many, many seasons, didn't you? Well, five, I think. Mm -hmm. Five or six. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking, and, and Pittsburgh won three division titles, right, mm -hmm. Dave, at that Something time? Something like that. That's like right. 90, 91, 92, right. maybe? They had Barry Bonds yes. and others. Yeah. 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 What, what, Bill, were you, were you expecting? When you saw an early Barry Bonds, you know, say back in 86, 87, he, could, did, did you ever uh, anticipate that he would end up with that kind of power? Well, I don't know. Of course, Bill knew his dad very well, too, Bobby Bonds. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, see, Bobby and Barry as a little, little kid. kid were with us in the, with the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. Um, and Bill, that was, you, weren't you playing at Shea Stadium at that time with, with the Yankees? Only manager, thought. basically, to have never played in Yankee Stadium. Isn't that something? Not never played in a Yankee Stadium, right. had never managed in Yankee but, yeah, Stadium. Yeah. Yeah, right. And I think, and because I'm still researching. he research played there in 60. <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. But I'm still researching this. Um, I, I still can't bring it to closure. The only player to oppose the Yankees in the World Series and then go on to manage the Yankees? Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still trying neat. to run that down. You know, when those, those years when, um, when Jim Leland had become manager of the Pirates, folks, yesterday Dave was relating this story. I thought it was so interesting. And the Pirates had brought in Bill to be Jim Leland's bench coach. 
If you could relate that story that we talked about yesterday, Dave, because I think it just says so much about Bill. Well, Bill ended up, you know, he was a coach for three different managers, uh, starting with Jim Leland, and they were in a game, and, and Jim was kind of torn about replacing somebody in the lineup, and he was really kind of torn, and Bill was sitting next to him. He said, Jim, you've got 25 guys on this team. You, decide, you make the decision, and it'll work. And Jim, I think, found a little bit of peace in that, so. Yes. Yeah. And of course, Bill went on to, to coach under uh, Larry Durker in uh, Houston in 97 uh, for one year. And yes. that's kind of an interesting story in itself. And then he finished out his coaching career under Lloyd McClendon in Pittsburgh. And that ended in 2002. That kind of brings up a, a last question for Bill, since we're coming to the end here. Bill, thinking about um, Lloyd McClendon, you know, uh, becoming a manager. Um, thinking about, for instance, Bruce Bochy, who played under you during your tenure in Houston. Did, 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 Bill, did Bochy aspire to be a major league manager at that point when he was a catcher for you? I don't know that he did, but okay. after he played for a while, I think I, he started getting that thought. Yes. Okay. And he, he was always good. Never made a mistake. And the, guy, the guy won three uh, uh, World Series titles. Uh, when was it? 2010, 12, and 14, maybe? I don't know. The, I don't know the sequence, but he was pretty impressive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Had a terrific managerial run. First with the Padres, and then and then with the Giants. <laughs> Bill also. Now, did Phil Garner and you cross paths? Was Phil playing in Houston for you at one time? Okay, so that was an, another person who played under Bill who became a longtime, very successful Major League Manager. Not so, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Bill had a great effect on a lot, of, yes, a lot of those people. And surely I'm so glad that your students were so persistent in bringing <laughs> you and Bill together. Well, uh, one of them's here, you know. Yes. Lives in Marshville. <laughs> who? That's, Bill Walker. Bill. Oh. He, he was, he was he the was, one who, that said yeah. that Shirley was hot as a teacher. Yeah. Right, that Shirley was hot as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Bill, I, 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 just, I just want to reiterate again to you, uh, you know, this meant so much to be on stage with you this morning. You'll say anything. No, no, I'm serious, <laughs> Bill. I, I'm serious. Um, I, I would gladly make the 650-mile trip to sit with you anytime. And I just want to thank Get you. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for, for providing so much entertainment for folks over the years. And, and I was visiting with a couple folks before we came on today about the importance of baseball and, and sports as entertainment. And I think about after a stellar player career, what a terrific run you had in managing those four ball clubs. And you gave people a chance to get away from all of their worries for two or three hours every day and, and let Bill Verdon and somebody else do the worrying for them. So, Bill, thank you very, very much for coming today. Shirley, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for thank being you. on stage. Please stay tuned because Larry, Dr. Larry Cook is going to be here at 1030 with a wonderful uh, presentation. He has amassed the greatest collection of presidential memorabilia anywhere in the world wow. and so please stay with us for that program as well let's have a big round of applause for bill Verdon. <laughs> bill thank you so much Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you ma'am folks thank you so much for coming out and and please do stay for larry's program it's going to be wonderful This meant a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shirley, thank you because this meant a lot.